uh, Chris was talking about uh, the changing nature of work and the expectation we may have to work longer or differently in the future. Uh, he was talking specifically about longevity, but that's also a question about uh, technology and how we might work differently in the future than we uh, do today. So that's a perfect segue into this panel. Let me introduce the moderator, uh, David Derrick, who is an entre entrepreneur and resident uh, at the Aspen Financial Security um, Project. And he is uh, a serial social uh, entrepreneur. Uh, his most recent venture is buyblack.com and uh, delighted to have you here to lead this panel. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, for today's panel, we're going to be talking about AI, the coming work revolution, and what it means for our future work lives. So just to put a little bit of context, if we think about what's happening in the world right now, um, just over a year ago, we were all exposed to ChatGPT and thinking about sort of how much has changed rapidly. But we have to keep, into, keep in mind that this is not sort of a, a revolution at the moment, but that things of AI has been being worked on for years. Um, and so that this is really starting to think about now that we've got an opportunity to really see it from sort of our, our level, meaning a non-programmer, just a person living their lives and, and interfacing with their computers. This, I think, is an exciting time for us to talk about what will it mean uh, going forward, what will it look like into the future, and how do we, um, how do we interact with it. So today we're going to have uh, three panelists. I'm just going to really facilitate a conversation here, but we're going to have Paul Oyer, Annika Havener, and Angela Aristidou. Um, but before we get into their introductions, I wanted to just take a quick, uh, quick show of hands to get a sense of where people are in the world these days. So how many of you have used ChatGPT? All right. How many of you are using it for personal reasons? OK, and how many of you are using it for work? All right, so if you've taken a look around, this is, uh, this is clearly something that is happening um, as we speak. So I think today's conversation is really gonna bring us to a place where we can talk about what's happening, look, at, look into the future about some things that are going to come, and, uh, and also probably leave some time at the end to, to answer some questions that folks may have. So first, if I can turn it over to you, Paul, if you wanna give an introduction of your background and then just uh, share with us what you're thinking about AI in general. Yeah, so thanks for having me and thanks for that introduction. I'm Paul Lawyer. I'm a professor of economics at the Stanford Graduate School of Business where I uh, research and teach labor economics. So I've been a labor economist for about 25 years or, oh, well, okay. Anyway, <laughs> that's being generous to myself. Um, so when I think about the future of work and, and how AI plays out, I did, well, let me put AI in context. I think of, of technology or AI as, when I look at the future of work, I think of three things, okay? And um, the first one, usually people wanna talk about AI. I usually wanna talk about something else. And normally this is a very problematic thing, getting people interested, but luckily I have a captive audience who came to a conference on the Century Summit. So what I've been proselytizing for a long time and people outside this room don't, don't necessarily believe me is, that the influence of the aging population is actually going to be much greater on the labor market going forward than the influence of AI. Um, you know, and we better start addressing that soon through public policy changes, retirement ages, all the things we've been talking, immigration and the like. Um, it's a much bigger issue. Here in the United States, it's a big issue, but it's, of course, a much bigger issue if any of you have been to Japan or South Korea or seen any of the numbers. You know, there. Luckily, we have these other countries where the problem is going to be much bigger first, and we in the United States can sit around and see what works or what doesn't there, and and try to do a little better. But you know, the statistic I like to give is in Japan between now and 2050, the impact of aging will be the alone will be the equivalent of lowering the GDP by 15 percent. So you're just going to be stealing 15 percent from the average person's pocket just by virtue of the demographic changes in Japan between now and then. So AI is a big deal, um, but I would also think of it a little differently than, than what you've read in the newspapers. AI is an incredible, and, and um, other technical changes we're seeing are incredible, but they're just an evolution. They're not a revolution. Technology has been changing the workplace for hundreds of years and the kinds of work, the kinds of effects we'll see in the next 20 plus years in the, in the world through AI are not really any different than the tractor or the spreadsheet. Right, they're going to have huge negative impacts on a, on a bunch of people's lives, and I don't want to under under 
uh, appreciate the, the negative consequences for a lot of people. And we need to do something about that, but we needed to do something about it when the tractor got rid of all the farmers and when um, trade, which is a form of technology, got rid of all the steel workers and so forth. So this is not new. This is not new. It's, it's all stuff we've seen before. And, and because of the, of, of the aging thing, I'm actually not worried about mass unemployment through AI. It's just the opposite. I'm worried about a shortage of workers because everybody is gonna look um, my age and older. Um, the final trend I'm gonna mention is, which is only peripherally related, but just important thing to think about going forward is the rise of women. Um, so during my lifetime, women have made incredible strides in the workplace. And if you look forward, it's just gonna continue to be the, the age of the woman in the workplace. Um, I say that because if you just look at who's getting college degrees and other graduate degrees now, the female share has just really become large and, and it continues to grow in graduate school, in college, other places. The one thing that's holding women back uh, is in education is that they don't major in STEM things. They don't study STEM fields. And so if you look in dollars, it's not quite, they haven't quite made the impact that they will, some, they will someday. And I think that's because of the things they choose to study. Um, so anyway, I'm sure we'll come back to that, but I'll, I will leave it. I will. Aging is the biggest challenge, as I, I as I've said, and AI is really important, but it's evolution, not revolution. So let me pass it down the row. Paul, one thing that's holding women back is STEM degrees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, so I won't, sorry, you, <laughs> I will say we can come back to this. I don't think it's central to what we're, the real thing that's holding women back is children. They're <laughs> on that note. <laughs> uh, um, well, good morning, everyone. I'm Annika Hevner. I'm the vice president of innovation and investment at the SCAN Foundation. The SCAN Foundation is a public charity based in Southern California that focuses really on the future of aging, uh, specifically in home and community. Uh, we do that really through a lens of equity and choice for older adults. Uh, we use the levers of policy, of community engagement uh, and advocacy, but the team that I look after is our innovation and investments capability. And our intent with having that capability is that there's a lot of emerging trends like AI and the workforce and aging that we want to be able to support the early exploration of through our capabilities in research, but also in solution development. And then ultimately also with our impact investing capability, we have dedicated 5% of our corpus to mission related investing that are uh, on issues that are impacting seniors. Um, and so for, for us with AI and the opportunity that it, it is presenting for older adults, we really look at this as an additive capability, something that's going to be able to support older adults continuing in the workforce um, in a way that, again, can create greater choice and complementary uh, capabilities. That being said, I wanna build upon what Paul was saying of this is brand new. We don't exactly know where this is going um, and how this is gonna show up and transform the labor markets. New industry is going to be created as much as also um, ways of working may transition or be retired. And so it's really a space for us to study and critically analyze together. Annika, I'm gonna follow up on that. Uh, my name is Angela Aristidou. I am a professor. I specialize in human expertise and AI. Myself and my team have been in this amazing position where we have been studying the deployment of AI tools when they come out of the computer science laboratories and into workplaces. And specifically, I study these tools in the hands of nurses, clinicians, uh, managers in hospital and healthcare settings. So um, I am particularly interested in the trends on longevity and aging populations because I see it on both sides in my context. In healthcare, I see an aging population that requires different types and different ways of being supported throughout their lifetime. And from the workforce side, I see a healthcare workforce that needs to find ways, new ways to work together with these AI tools to deliver the expectations of the society of them. 
So from those both perspectives, I have launched a series of studies in the US, the UK, Canada, and China. And we are in a good position now to have some findings that I hope are going to carry forward in our conversation today. But the central focus of what we have found and the key gem is that people have um, prioritized different skills and people have abandoned some skills that they had treasured over time. And the combination of the two was in some instances unexpected, what, what happened first and what happened later. I find it particularly interesting because when I look at um, the field and as it's evolving, I see a completely new ecosystem shaping out out there. And this is what I hope I'm gonna to contribute today to this panel. Great. Well, I think, Annika, let's start with you for um, thinking a bit more about this additive component. So you talk a little bit about giving people greater choice using AI. Yeah. Can you just uh, paint a picture for us of what that looks like, um, either from an investment standpoint yeah. and an innovation standpoint? Yeah, I think when we talk about the additive component of AI, we have to go back to a little bit of what Chris teed us up for in the prior conversation of the, the transformation we want to see in the workplace, first and foremost. We want to see more good quality jobs for all ages and all abilities, jobs with benefits, jobs with flexibility. Um, and of course, again, when we think about all ages, all abilities, it is complementary to uh, physical, mental, and emotional needs for all ages. Um, and so as we think about you know, the introduction of AI into the workforce, uh, the opportunity that this presents is AI is going to get, again, potentially come along and be a complementary way of working. Um, and we have to define those new roles and the way that it's gonna come along and help us do our jobs. All of us have this responsibility. It's not just a, you know, something that is on older adults. Um, and I know Angela will talk to some of the, the emerging spaces where in healthcare, um, we're seeing AI really make a transformation. That being said, when you think about hype cycles and, for, and maybe some of you are familiar with the concept of hype cycles and how uh, a new technology is introduced. There's a triggering event of a new technology being introduced, and then there's early adoption, and then there's a little bit of disillusionment. Maybe it's not as good as we thought, but eventually it stabilizes and it finds optimization scale and reaches and sort of democratizes, and then it reaches sort of you know an obsolete state where you know the hype cycle repeats and the next technology is introduced. Where this journey is not equitable is that you know, older adults on that hype cycle of the introduction of AI, they're at the tail end. The early adopters are those who come from well-resourced, well-educated, um, financially stable, and well-connected communities. And they have the privilege to help shape how these emerging technologies are then leveraged in a variety of different settings, like the workplace. And so from our perspective, we really see a need to start to elevate how we are inclusive in the design of these emerging tools and understand how we can be more, and when we say inclusive, you know, the concepts of AI are quite complex, but that doesn't mean it can't have a human-centered design component. And so we really wanna champion how we can be more inclusive. And that doesn't necessarily mean we all need to go get computer science degrees. It starts with you know, a level of curiosity and sort of informal, um, informal reskilling and informal upskilling. It's um, us playing around with chat GPT. Um, I know that I am gonna write an epic Thanksgiving toast thanks to chat GPT. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it, that's something that you know, all of us can play around with. And that's the beginning of reskilling and upskilling. It doesn't have to be a formalized program. We need those too. But um, I think when we think about the equity journey, it starts with curiosity. Thank you. So, so Angela, you, you, we had some discussions and you talk about the fact that your lab does a lot of observations of actual, of, of people doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some examples in terms of um, how you're seeing AI being put to use today and how, and you talked a little bit about some of the changes that come as a result of people, uh, as a result of AI. So share with us a little bit about how that's changing. So in the context of healthcare, what I've seen was that AI is not used to substitute people. So that has not come across. There's this uh, debate going on whether AI is going to substitute or whether it's going to augment. What I see is the augmentation part. 
I see hybrid teams, teams of AI together with clinicians, nurses, and other um, staff in the healthcare space working together in order to amplify the effect of what it is that they're doing in their team's task. Now, what I've also seen is that sometimes um, AI can be a fantastic tool. It can be used as a cognitive prosthetic. The idea that you can offload things that you would otherwise um, not be able to do in a certain amount of time or things that would evade you with the passing of time to do as well as you used to before. In that sense, I speak of a prosthetic, a cognitive prosthetic tool. It can also be used- Could, could you give us an example sure. of, of that? Um, so I see radiologists who are very often tasked with having a lot of information in front of them in various modalities. Some of it is in images, your CT scans. Some of it is in text, doctor's notes. Some of it is through their own exchange and um, voice notes that they have taken while they were discussing with the patient. And all of that has to come together in order for them to make a decision about this patient's treatment and future care plan. What I often saw in the past was that this process would take multiple hours because it would require back and forth, remembering bits from here, translating it into what it means there. Instead, some recent tools in radiology allow these clinicians to be able to do that in a more coherent way without having to hold so much information at the same time in their mind. Now, the key thing, though, there is my second point, which is they always retain responsibility of the decisions that are made on the basis of the output of the AI. And that's why it's human centric. At the end of the day, it is human centric, not because of the design that should be friendly to humans. I agree with that. And my colleagues in the human AI centered who are um, very keen on that aspect, I respect that, but also it is human centered because of the fact that any output that comes out of the AI in the end is judged and interpreted by the humans who are the experts in that domain. And are you seeing any changes in terms of the actual roles of people? Um, doctors shifting, nurses shifting, um, assistants? Absolutely, yes. So in the same context of radiology that I'll keep for this example, um, before the introduction of an AI tool, a lot of this work was done by radiologists. After the introduction of the AI tool, the first draft was done by the nurses, and then it was brought to a review team meeting with radiologists, nurses, and other clinical staff in order to be approved. So it didn't just change who was doing the particular task, but it also changed the process around it. And that was fascinating. In the end though, the humans made the decision. So we've, we've heard a lot about the kind of healthcare, um, how we're seeing some different changes in terms of roles with people having there. But I think Paul, uh, as a labor economist, you've talked to, you've, you've also looked at gig platforms. And I think as we open up this conversation, we should think a little bit about the types of roles that we see just across our society. They're you know, obviously beyond healthcare. Could you just give us a little bit of um, a little bit of background in terms of how gig platforms have sort of played out for older Americans? Um, thinking about uh, let's start there, and then we'll kind of add into the AI components of. It. Yeah. So I I think people are. Um, think of gig platforms as a good way for people to extend their their careers and their um you know have part-time things where they take on and and continue their work and have something that gets them out of bed and keeps them active and their minds going and i think that's a great potential use of gig platforms um but i i get a little nervous about any sort of re semi-retirement plan that involves people taking on learning new ways of doing things. So if you can take the skills you developed during your first career and apply them in some sort of role online later on in life, I think that's a great thing. And I think that might lead to a divide that might be indicative of, of, of the fact that a lot of these challenges around aging and extending retirement ages and so forth can be potentially unequal. So it might be easy for some white collar person to go on and continue doing their what they were doing in a consultative consultative role online 
Um, but what I'm more worried about is sort of people who uh, who have more day, uh, you know, labor intensive blue collar type jobs. And we did a study uh, on a gig platform that was both, um, I think, promising for older workers and troubling, and it was at Uber. So we looked at Uber and what you find at Uber is that um, 60 year olds make noticeably less than 30 year olds on a per hour basis driving on Uber. And if you think about like any other plat, any other, job, if you look at a 60-year-old versus a 30-year-old, the 30-year-olds make less than the 60-year-old. But in something like this, where you're learning a new set of tasks at this point in your life, it's harder when you're six. I'm allowed to say this now because I'm 60, right? So <laughs> I didn't, you know, used to be insulting, but now I'm allowed to say it. And if, and so, you know, I worry a little bit about people thinking about these second careers and side issues, if it's meant to just keep them Busy, not busy. That that's that's came out wrong. If it's meant to keep them sharp and interested and give them something to do during the day that that will get them excited, then I think these sort of gig platforms are a great thing. But if it's meant to really replace a significant amount of income, I think we have to think carefully about whether that's going to work or not. Of course, Paul. Can you unpack a little bit more around some of your research and and what evidence you found around the challenges of learning a new skill later in life? Yeah, so, I mean, the the Uber example is one very simple one where you just, if you just put a new driver in who's 30 versus a new driver who's 60, the 30 year old starts earning, you know, is earning quite a bit more in Uber right away. And, you know, we, some of that has to do with, look, by, by the way, some of that just is, uh, that has to do with where they live, right? 60 year olds live in Palo Alto and or maybe this isn't a good example. 60 year olds live in uh, um, you know, Westchester County and 30 year olds live in Queens and Brooklyn and that by itself makes a difference. But part of it is just the learning process. So, you know, getting, again, yeah, you, you and, and um, the other reason I would say that that goes beyond the, backing off from the gig platform and sort of coming to some of the topics you talked about are just, mm -hmm. if you look in general at reskilling programs, as mm -hmm. we, you know, like there's a, um, I think it was Chris in the last session was talk, made the prediction about universities, but there is a reason young people are in universities and the rest of us don't spend as much time. And that is people learn better, learn mm -hmm. better when they're young and, and, so, you know, if you look at reskilling, it really becomes more and more of a challenge to re-educate people who have bad luck as they get older in their careers. I mean, the, the reskilling at scale is something that just hasn't been solved very well, as, as you know better than I do. There may be, there may be a, a way to think about it as reskilling at scale, but highly individualized, which is what AI allows us yeah. to do nowadays. So what AI can do and does very well is identify patterns and sort through options for you. And with learning, that is fantastic because what is not in the far horizon right now is very customized, tailored, individual learning, upskilling programs that I will be able to opt into for myself based on what I want. That was not so much an option before. Yeah, and we so haven't seen that work yet, but like if, if I, if, if I want the rosiest possible picture I can I can paint for AI, and I'm very hopeful this will be true, but we're not we're nowhere near this yet. Is an that's no, a full and disclaimer. I, and I'm, disclaimer. I'm an optimist on this too. I mean, this would be fantastic. Is like I said, in history, the history of reskilling at any scale isn't very good because if you put a bunch of people who lost their steel jobs together in the same room, they're not their next the next thing they should do isn't all the same. And if they take the same reskilling program, it'll work for a few and it'll be not that great for others. Now you're right. AI gives us the opportunity for individual. So imagine if Coursera, just it could be something else, but take Coursera. If Coursera is able to tell you and I, you do this course, you do that course, and then really give us individualized training, 
boy, that would solve a lot. That would that could really help a lot. So I agree. Um, so I'm I'm optimistic about that too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so Annika, thinking about that, and you've you've talked about you you mentioned to begin with some of the reskilling. Are you seeing opportunities for and thinking about inclusivity? Are you seeing opportunities for either recipients of healthcare or healthcare organizations to be able to employ AI to get people into new new pathways or to extend their career? Absolutely. So when we at the Scan Foundation, sort of our model of development within our innovation and investments team is one, we want to engage in that early stage research. We want to develop that AI training program and learn and study, is this an effective way of upskilling and reskilling? And if there is opportunity there, how do we then champion solutions and partnerships? So an example of this that we're doing now is, is in clinical algorithmic auditing. Um, there's what, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you guys don't know? Oh. <laughs> um, so, uh, and Angela, please hop in and, and support this. All but, yours. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so obviously clinical algorithms um, are being deployed as Angela spoke to using the radiology example as a way to help uh, look at uh, images at scale and sort of be able to diagnose more rapidly, layman's terms here. Um, and so the opportunity that we are seeing is sure those algorithms are effectively trained on a data set, a data set that could be limited in that it came from a specific geography of a specific type of patient, specific background, might not be representative. And so that algorithm might skew and it might say, this is the type of diagnosis we wanna give um, for all patients when that might not be accurate. This research um, really has been led by Dr. Ziad Obermeyer uh, out of UC Berkeley on racial bias in algorithms. Um, he's been looking at care management platforms that insurers use to determine who would need uh, additional care after being discharged from the hospital. Um, I'm not gonna get the, the exact numbers right, but um, the algorithm said 20% of the patient population um, that was black needed additional care. When uh, they examined that and tested for racial bias, it was actually 40% of the black population of, of aging adults that needed additional caregiving support. And so we are seeing a need to be able to look at algorithms that are deployed and ensure that they have one, been trained appropriately, that there is quality, that there's accuracy in the way that they have been um, then utilized in clinical practice. And then if the model drifts because of the type of patient population or um, environment that the, the model has been deployed in, we can appropriately tailor that and recalibrate. And so for us as an organization, we wanna to continue to elevate the issues of ageism and bias that we're seeing in clinical algorithm development. And so um, one, we're funding you know, some early stage research in this, but two, we're partnering with organizations that also recognize this and wanna generate the next generation of solutions. So we're working with an organization called Dandelion Health um, that does clinical algorithm auditing, but they leverage data sets from community hospitals, safety net hospitals, um, hospitals that are predominantly um, of African-American populations and you leveraging that to help sort of give a, a good housekeeping sale of approval on clinical, algorithmic, um, clinical algorithms that are then soon to be deployed in the clinic. Um, so not only do we want to champion more research, we want to champion um, solution development, and ultimately we also want to invest in this too. Um, and so that's really the landscape that we want to participate in to really champion more of the equity and inclusion of AI. And Angela, from your perspective, um, as you're looking, as you're observing and seeing these different uh, AI being used in different areas, uh, role shifting from radiologists, if you were to kind of look out into the future, what is the opportunity for, um, for people aging, for people being able to keep their jobs or if they chose to work longer to be able to do so? I mean, maybe, maybe I think for what would be helpful is for us to think a little bit of what would, what would a day in the life look like or what would a career choice sort of look like? Um, you know, could I, I think to Paul's point, the, the scale of you know, getting to individualize, um, upscale, upskilling, uh, mm -hmm. Help us with that. Now, granted, this is not a uh, this is not necessarily happening, but no, no, that's absolutely fine. Um, what I would say is that all the concerns that I heard today and the 
possibilities that I was exposed to today through the other panels um, around the future of work and aging are things that I would tell someone that they should be thinking about well in their 20s and 30s. So they are more prominent right now, but the ethical issues around displacement and meaning and reskilling or upskilling and maintaining quality of life in later years, those are things that are not only the concern of people who are in their 50s and above anymore. With the way that automation is happening, those are concerns that anybody, including people who have kids, should be thinking about for themselves and their families long term. So for me, this conversation is very timely because I think if we can come up with ideas of how the landscape might be shaped now, we might also have input for the future generations. And with that in mind, what would a day in the life look like? I would envision that people have flexibility in how they structure their work and life, and that would stretch across the decades of their life. And in order to do that, there have to be policy reconfigurations that are not negligible to take place first. Um, I would envision a future where people have tailored healthcare. That has been the holy grail in healthcare and um, population health departments for the past, I don't know, century or so. Or as long as people have been thinking of healthcare, they have been thinking of tailored, customized, personalized healthcare. I think this is the first time that we can actually say we have the technological tools to be able to do that. What we are lacking is the infrastructure and the will to be able to roll that out at scale and to make sure that it is available to everybody and not just those who are privileged enough to be able to afford it. Um, and the third thing that I would say along those lines is that um, when we think about work, we have to have a shift in our perspective of work as skills instead of work as a package um, that determines our identity. So work as skills means that even if your technical skills are no longer needed, even if your um, skills that you value, that you cherish, that you have developed over decades, that you have trained and sacrificed for somehow no longer are required in the new workplace, you should consider what other skills are available to you and think of them as a repertoire and deploy them in a different way. And that is very difficult to do when for most of us in the West, at least, our identity is very tightly knit with our work identity. Thank you. So one thing, I, one thing, one takeaway that, I've, that, that keeps coming back to me is, um, is we've been talking about the personalization of AI and the ability for it to, to really be myself and my interaction with, with, um, with, with an artificial intelligence. But bringing these two things together, I think about the last session, to us speaking about savings, thinking about finance, and, and this one where we've been focused very heavily on health. But the two are, are clearly integrated. Um, you know, our, our, our physical health is oftentimes uh, influenced by our, our financial health and vice versa. So I'm, I'm curious if there's some opportunities for us, um, and maybe coming back to you, Paul, on this, thinking about, as you said, you know, the aging, age is, is really the bigger, the bigger question, and how do we extend ourselves to this? Are there opportunities that you see you know, beyond a gig platform, um, ways in which we might apply AI to really think about how we will individually use these? Um, and maybe this is just a good, a, a, an opportunity if you think there's some tools or best practices, or even just some cautions um, as we think about sort of uh, extending our, extending our, our our working lives. Yeah. So, um, wow. Six minutes. Um, <laughs> no, you only I, get one. I, I only get one. Time. Exactly. <laughs> um, I've already taken half of the time I had. Um, yeah, I would, I, I think I would just, I would just, I'm going to be a business school professor for a second and turn to the managers out there and the people who help others and develop, you know, think about your workplaces of the future and say, these AI tools are incredible and you're going to want you're going to have to integrate them into your workplaces and you're also going to have to grapple with the fact that while we can try to find ways to make them augment work 
some of these tools are going to substitute for work and people are going to lose their jobs and that we're just going to have to accept that. That's number one. And when you do augment work, you have to, I think the example you gave of the radiologist where the process changed, that's something you have to keep in mind. You, we all kind of think you're just going to put an AI tool in and everything's going to be taken care of. AI train, you have to train the workers to use the AI and you have to use the workers to train, you have to use the workers to train the AI and use the AI. You have to train the workers to be able to use uh, the AI as well. It's a back and forth. That's all I would say is think carefully about the workplace of the future won't work its way out. Managers have to make it happen in an effective and profitable way. Paul, you made a really interesting point on our prep call around, you know, again, the technology revolution, whether it's the tractor, whether it's the creation of the car, you know, there's knock on effects that are unexpected. So with the creation of the car, we're doing the great American road trip, and now there's a need for motels. And so there's a lot of industry, though, that, again, while some things may be subsidized or eliminated through, you know, the utilization of AI, we also don't know the industry that is going to be created from this yet. I always say my grandfather was a farmer and, um, you know, there's no farmers left to a first approximation. And he had no like if you told him what his grandchildren and great grandchildren did, he would have said, <laughs> what is that job? And there are like a hundred my grandchildren are going to do jobs. And if I'm. God, you know, if I were alive, I'd be like, what? Because we don't know what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what we do know is that some skills are going to be valuable going forward. So emotional intelligence and being able to work in teams, communication, being able to uh, strategize. AI is, AI is a fantastic tool. AI can be a really good teammate in hybrid teams. AI is not a strategy maker. It's not going to give us the questions that we should be asking. It's not going to help us think about what we want to explore, for example, in scientific discovery. That is still, at this point, at least not something AI can do. So I would challenge us to think about what we have in our toolbox of skills and leverage that going forward, rather than thinking about what we've lost. Yesterday, people keep peopling, and that's going to be our superpower. Human centered. Okay. <laughs> um, we've got a few few moments left here, and and I do want to get a chance to uh, to get some questions in. But something for you all to think about as uh, as we take some questions is, um, when we leave here, I'd like for you to each think of, to say, here's something that I think is going to be promising about AI. But if we have any questions in the audience, we've got a couple minutes. Yes, there's a question from the online audience. They ask, if AI is changing who does what and the process, as in the radiology example, what are the implications, do you think, um, for the wages, in this case, that the nurses would demand versus physicians? Hey, this is a fantastic question. I think nobody has the answer for that yet. <laughs> we see the field evolving in that direction. Um, but what I can say outside the field of healthcare is that I would be really surprised if in a year's time, we do not have a badge of some sort, some certification, similar to the products you see in supermarkets saying organic only, we're going to see badges like that saying human produced only. That would be a pricing point difference for a lot of services out there. And not only in the creative space, I suspect. Uh, specific to the question, I can speculate that it would give bargaining power to the nurses if they had collective bargaining arrangements. That would make sense, but maybe Paul can speak more to that. I mean, I, I'm not a labor. I, I don't know. You know the example much better about radiology. I'll just <laughs> say that historically, these types of technologies have made this, have benefited skilled people more than unskilled people. And there's some hope and suggestion that AI will be different. I think that's a bit premature, but it could be because, you know, it's displacing higher end white collar jobs. I think it's actually displacing lower end jobs faster. So I'm, I'm not as optimistic that this is the turnaround of inequality. One more. Thank you for that question though. 
Yeah. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this um, exciting panel. I'm one of those professors that needs to figure out chat GPT real quick because my students are <laughs> probably already doing it. Um, and speaking of jobs that don't exist, my father was an elevator operator. So I've definitely, um, and my mother was a secretary that, you know, worked on a typewriter and lost her job in the early 90s recession. And then computers were everywhere. And there were no public libraries to, you know, reskill her. So I guess my question is, you know, we've heard a lot in the various panels about keeping um, workers working longer and flexibility and more on their terms. And I guess maybe this is kind of a related question, but um, how do we incentivize workplaces to actually meet older workers where they are? And what about age discrimination? I'm just really worried in lots of different ways about kind of wide swaths of older adults and older meaning, you know, midlife people who are being laid off in their 50s and then can't get that same job that they were and highly educated people as well. So anyway, um, any insights would be much appreciated. Thank you. I'm looking at you. I'm looking at the labor economy. <laughs> well, I'll just give you the shortest, oh, oh. I'll give you a very short answer. And that is that um, sometimes markets work really well. And you're gonna have a lot of 70 year olds in a few years and not very many 25 year olds and firms that are smart are gonna figure out how to use the 70 year olds in a way that's a win-win for them and the 70 year olds. And we haven't seen them forced to, so age discrimination is a luxury you had when there were plenty of young people. <laughs> and, and um, you know, markets get rid of discrim, market, they don't, it's not perfect for, you know, all markets are not perfect to get rid of, getting rid of discrimination by any means, but they actually make progress. And I think that, when we have a lot of people my age and not that many people my children's age, you're gonna see uh, firms get pretty creative. And, and again, by the way, if you're an American firm and you can't be creative, just wait a few years and see what they do in Japan and Korea because they are gonna have to figure it out like tomorrow, whereas we can wait 10 or 20 years. So I think, oh, go ahead. I, we're, 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 we're actually at time. So Sorry. I wanna say uh, thank you all for participating in this and sharing your different viewpoints. Before we uh, let them go, you have one rapid fire, just what is your, what's your, uh, what's the thing you are thinking about is going to be a positive of AI? Well, I'll, I'll just come back to this point. If it can personalize reskilling and it's, and we're a long way from this. So it might be 20 years. I think that's okay. <laughs> I hope you're right. So personalizing reskilling. I hope you're right. Personalized education would be just so amazing. Yep. I think it's such a privilege for us to see the technology evolution in front of our eyes and have the ability to shape it. This is definitely a point when um, I would agree with both my co-panelists. And then to that, I would add that if you are an organizational leader or a leader in your context, take a minute to think about how this would affect your people within your organization and your uh, strategy around training them and retaining them and um, augmenting the workforce in this way. Thank you, Angela, Annika, Paul. Thank you all.